Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you so much for that um, warm and uh, exhaustive, if not <laughs> exhausting, in introduction. Um, and, um, and I thank all of you for gathering here um, this evening, and especially my hosts, my host committee, and the principal for um, welcoming me and making it possible for me to offer the Gifford Lectures this year. I plan to speak to you in these three lectures on nonviolence, but perhaps not in the usual way. For instance, I will not be defending a principle of nonviolence that should be applied in all instances. And I will not be associating nonviolence with a calm or a pacifist region of the soul. Nonviolence is not the same as passivity, even though passive forms of resistance are surely part of what is included within the range of its instances. My wager is that nonviolence becomes an ethical issue within the force field of violence itself. It's perhaps best described as a practice of resistance that becomes possible, if not mandatory, precisely at the moment when doing violence seems most justified and most obvious. In this way, nonviolence can be understood as a practice that not only stops a violent act or a violent process, but which requires a form of sustained action, sometimes aggressively pursued. So one suggestion I will make is that we can think of nonviolence not simply as the absence of violence or the act of refraining from committing violence, but as a sustained commitment even a way of rerouting aggression for the purposes of affirming ideals of equality and freedom. My first suggestion is that what Einstein called militant pacifism might be rethought as aggressive nonviolence. That will involve me in rethinking the relation between aggression and violence, since the two are not the same. My second suggestion, which I hope will be more fully elaborated as an argument over the next days, is that nonviolence does not make sense without a commitment to equality. The reason why nonviolence requires a commitment to equality can be understood best by considering that in this world some lives are more clearly valued than others, and that this inequality implies that certain lives will be more tenaciously defended than others. If one opposes the violence done to human lives or indeed to other living beings as well, then that presumes that we oppose the injury done to those lives because those lives are valuable. And we oppose the killing or indeed the letting die of those lives because those lives are valuable. If they were to be lost as a result of violence, that loss would be registered as a loss and that means that we regard those lives as worthy of grief. And yet, in this world, as we know, lives are not equally valued. Their claim against being injured or killed is not always registered. And one reason for this is that their lives are not considered worthy of grief or grievable. The reasons for this are many, and they include racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and transphobia, misogyny, and the systemic disregard for the poor and the dispossessed. We live in a daily way with knowledge of nameless groups of people abandoned to death on the borders of countries with closed borders in the Mediterranean Sea, in countries where poverty and access to food and health care has become um, uh, impossible. If we seek to understand what nonviolence means in this world in which we now live, we have to know the modalities of violence to be opposed. But also, we have to return to a fundamental question, a philosophical question that belongs to our time, namely, what makes a life valuable, what accounts for the unequal way that lives are valued, and how might we begin to formulate an egalitarian imaginary that would become part of our practice of nonviolence, a practice of resistance, both vigilant and hopeful.
This evening, I will turn to the problem of individualism in order to foreground the importance of social bonds and interdependency for understanding a non-individualist account of equality. And I will seek to link this idea of interdependence with nonviolence. In the second of these lectures, I will begin by asking about the resources of moral philosophy for developing a reflective practice of nonviolence and suggest that socially imbued fantasies enter into our moral reasoning on nonviolence so that we cannot always identify the demographic assumptions we make about lives that are worth valuing and those that are considered relatively or absolutely worthless. That reflection moves from Kant to Freud and Klein. In my final lecture, I will consider the ethics and politics of nonviolence in light of contemporary forms of racism and social policy, suggesting that Fanon gives us a way to understand racial phantasms that inform the ethical dimension of biopolitics, and that Walter Benjamin's idea of an open-ended civil, civil technique of conflict resolution gives us some way to think about living with and through conflictual relations without violent conclusions. To that end, I will suggest that aggression is a component part of social bonds based on interdependency, but emphasize that aggression can be crafted and that this makes the difference for a practice that resists violence and imagines a new future of social equality. The imagination and what is imaginable will turn out to be crucial for thinking through this argument because we are, at this moment, ethically obligated and incited to think beyond what are too often treated as the realistic limits of the possible. Some representatives of the history of liberal political thought would have us believe that we emerge into this social and political world from a state of nature. You've heard the story. And in that state of nature, we are already, for some reason, individuals. Um, and we are in conflict with one another. We're not given to understand how we became individuated, nor are we told precisely why conflict is the first of our passionate relations, rather than dependency or attachment. The Hobbesian view, which has been the most influential in shaping our understanding of political contracts, tells us that one individual wants what another has, or that both individuals lay claim to the same territory and that they fight with one another to pursue their selfish aims and to establish their personal right to property, to nature, and to social dominance. Of course, the state of nature was always a fiction, as Rousseau openly conceited, but it, ha but it has been a powerful fiction a mode of imagining that becomes possible under conditions that Marx called political economy and later came to be understood either as property relations or indeed as capitalism. The state of nature functions in many ways. It gave us a counterfactual condition by which to assess our contemporary situation. It offered a point of view in the way that science fiction does from which to see the specificity and contingency of the political organization of space and time, of passions and interests in the present. Writing on Rousseau, Jean Stachowski opined that the state of nature provided an imaginary framework in which there is only one individual in the scene, self-sufficient, without dependency, saturated in self-love, yet without any need for another. Indeed, where there are no persons to speak of, there is no problem of equality. But once other living human creatures enter the scene, the problem of equality and conflict immediately emerge. Why is that the case? Well, Marx criticized that part of the state of nature hypothesis that posits the individual as primary. In his 1844 manuscripts, when, with great Irony, he ridiculed the notion that in the beginning humans are, like Robinson Crusoe, 
alone on an island providing for their own sustenance, living without dependency on others, without systems of labor, and without any common organization of political and economic life. Marx writes, and I quote, let us not put ourselves in that fictitious primordial state like a political economist trying to clarify things. It merely pushes the issue into a gray, misty distance. We proceed from a present fact of political economy, end quote. Marx thought he could discard fiction in favor of present fact, but that didn't stop him from making use of those very fictions to develop his critique of political economy. They do not represent reality, but if we know how to read such fictions, they yield a commentary on present reality that we otherwise might not achieve. One enters the fiction in order to discern the structure, but also to ask what can and cannot be figured here, what can be imagined, and through what terms. For instance, that lonely and sufficient figure of Robinson Crusoe was invariably an adult and a man. The first figure of the natural man, the one whose self-sufficiency is eventually interrupted by the demands of social and economic life, but not as a consequence of his natural condition. Indeed, when others enter the scene, conflict begins, or so the story goes. So in the beginning, temporally considered, and most fundamentally, ontologically considered, individuals pursue their selfish interests. They clash and fight. But conflict becomes arbitrated um, only in the midst of a regulated sociality. Each individual would presumably, prior to entering the social contract, seek to pursue and satisfy his wants regardless of its effects on others and without any expectation of resolution, indeed without resolving those competing or clashing desires. The contract emerges, according to this fiction, first and foremost as a means of conflict resolution. Each individual must restrict one's desires, put limits on their capacity to consume, to take, and to act, in order to live according to commonly binding laws. For Hobbes, those laws become the common power by which human nature is restrained. The state of nature was not exactly an ideal, and Hobbes did not call for a return to that state, as Rousseau sometimes did. For he imagined that lives would be cut short, that murder would be unrestrained if there were no common government and no binding set of laws to subdue the conflictual character of human nature. The state of nature was, for him, a war, but not a war among states or existing authorities, but a war waged by one sovereign individual against another, a war, we might add, of individuals who regard themselves as sovereign. For it's unclear whether that sovereignty belongs to an individual conceived of as separate from the state who transfers his own sovereignty to the state. That's how we see it if we move from the state of nature to the con social contract um, or the covenant in Hobbes's terms. But we could ask uh, whether, in fact, the state is already there uh, as the horizon of this imaginary, of this idea of the state of nature. Let's be clear, the state of nature is not one thing. It differs in Locke, Rousseau, and Hobbes. And even within Hobbes's Leviathan, there are arguably at least five versions. The state of nature can postulate a time before society. It can seek to describe foreign civilizations that are assumed to be pre-modern. It can offer a political psychology that accounts for civil strife. It can describe political power dynamics within 17th century Europe. I'm not exactly conducting a scholarly review, but I want to consider how the state of nature becomes the occasion for a certain kind of imagining, if not a fantasy, or what Rousseau calls a pure fiction, one that is centrally concerned with violent conflict and its resolution. As such, we can ask, under what historical conditions do such fantasies or fictions take hold? They become possible and persuasive from within a condition of social conflict or as a consequence of its history. They represent, perhaps, the dream of an escape from the sufferings associated with the capitalist organization of work 
or they function as a justification for that very organization. They articulate and comment upon the arguments for strengthening state power and its instruments of violence to cultivate or contain the popular will. They emerge in our understanding of populism, the condition in which the popular will is imagined to, to assume an unconstrained form. They encode and reproduce forms of domination and exploitation that set classes and religious or racial groups against one another as if something called tribalism was a primitive or natural condition that rears up and explodes if states fail to exercise their restraining powers. That is, if states fail to impose their own violence, including legal violence. If we understand the state of nature as a fiction or a fantasy, and the two are not the same, as I hope to discuss, then what set of wishes or desires does it represent or articulate? I suggest that these wishes belong neither simply to the individual nor to an autonomous psychic life, but maintain a critical relation to the social and economic conditions upon which they comment. The state of nature can function as an inverted picture, a critical commentary, a justification, or a ruthless critique. What is posited as an origin or an original condition is retrospectively imagined and so posited as the result of a sequence that begins in the already constituted social world. And yet there is a yearning to posit a foundation, an imaginary origin as a way of accounting for this world or perhaps of escaping its pain and alienation. This train of thought could easily lead us down a psychoanalytic path if we were to take seriously the idea that a fantasy functions as a foundation for human life in its social aspects. This may well be true. My desire is not to replace fantasy with reality, but rather to learn how to understand fantasy as yielding key insights into the structure and dynamic of historically constituted organizations of power and violence as they relate, relate to life and death. Indeed, I myself will not be able to offer a critical rejoinder to this notion of a man without needs at the origin of social life without engaging a fantasy of my own, one that does not start with me, but takes me up into its terms, articulating, as it were, the syntax of the social through a different imaginary. One rather remarkable feature of this state of nature fantasy, which is regularly invoked as a foundation, is that in the beginning, apparently, there is a man and he is adult and he is on his own self-sufficient. So let's take notice that this story begins not at the beginning, but in the middle of a history that is not about to be told. With the opening moment of the story, with the moment that marks the beginning, gender, for instance, has been already decided. Independence and dependency have been separated. The masculine and feminine are determined in part in relation to this distribution of dependency. The primary and founding figure of the human is masculine. That comes as no great surprise. Masculinity, though, is defined by its lack of dependency. And although that is not exactly news, it continues somehow to be quite startling. What does seem interesting, and it is as true for Hobbes as it is for Marx, is that the human is, from the, from the start, an adult man. In other words, the individual who is introduced to us as the first moment of the human, the outbreak of the human onto the world, as it were, is posited as if he were never a child, was never provided for, never depended upon parents or kinship relations or social institutions to survive and grow and presumably learn. That individual has already been cast as a gender, but not by social assignment, and because he is an individual and the social form of the individual is masculine in this scene, he is a man. So if we wish to understand this fantasy, we have to ask what version of the human and what version of gender it represents and what occlusions are required for that representation to work. 
Dependency is, as it were, written out of the picture of the original man. He is somehow, and from the start, always and already upright, capable, without ever having been supported by others, without having held on to another's body in order to steady himself, without ever having been fed when he could not feed himself, without ever having been wrapped in a blanket for warmth by someone else. He sprang, lucky guy, from the imagination of liberal theorists as a full adult, without relations, equipped with anger and desire, sometimes capable of happiness or some mode of self-sufficiency that depended on a natural world, preemptively void of other people and malleable to his will. Shall we then concede that an annihilation has taken place prior to the scene that is narrati narrated and that an annihilation inaugurates the scene and everyone else is excluded, negated, and from the start? Is that perhaps an inaugural violence? It is not a tabula rasa, but rather a slate wiped clean. And so too is the prehistory of the so-called state of nature, since the state of nature is supposed to be, in one of its most influential variants, a prehistory of social and economic life. The, uh, the annihilation of alterity constitutes the prehistory of this prehistory, suggesting that we are not only elaborating a fantasy, but giving a history of that fa very fantasy, fantasy, arguably a murder or an obliteration that leaves no trace. The social contract, as many feminist theorists have argued, Carol Pateman among them, is already a sexual contract. But even before women enter the picture, there is only this individual man. There is, yes, somewhere a woman in the scene, but she does not take form as a figure. We cannot even fault the representation of women in the scene because she is, at least at the beginning, unrepresentable. An expulsion of some sort has taken place. In its place is erected the adult man. He's assumed to desire women in the course of things, but even this postulated heterosexuality is free of dependency and rests on a cultivated amnesia regarding his formation. He is understood to encounter others first only in a conflictual way. Why bother with this influential fantasy and political theory? After all, my topic is the ethics and politics of nonviolence. I'm not actually going to argue against the primary character of conflictual relations. In fact, I will insist that conflict is, pot is a potential part of every social bond and that Hobbes is not altogether wrong. Indeed, Freud harbors a Hobbesian thesis when he challenges the biblical commandment to honor thy neighbor and not covet his wife. For why, Freud asks, should we not assume that enmity and hostility are more fundamental than love? My own thesis, which will arrive a bit later, is that if nonviolence is to make sense as an ethical and political position, it cannot simply repress aggression or do away with its reality. Rather, nonviolence emerges as a meaningful concept precisely when destruction is most likely or seems most certain. When destruction becomes the ardent aim of desire but is nevertheless checked, what accounts for that check? that imposition of a limit and a displacement. From where does it come? What lets it take hold and be maintained? Some would say that the check on violence is always a form of self-checking. It's the superego that checks the externalization of aggression, even as the superego is the name we have for the process of absorbing aggression into the architecture of the psyche itself. The economy of the superego is a moralism whereby aggression unleashes itself against itself and the psychic life that bears it. It denounces violence and the denunciation becomes a new form of violence in the course of things. Others would say that this check on violence can only be applied from the outside, outside by law, by government, even the police. That is the more properly Hobbesian view. The coercive power of the state is necessary to contain the potentially murderous rage of its unruly subjects. Others claim that there is a calm or, specific, or pacific region of the soul and that we must cultivate the capacity to dwell, 
always there, subduing aggression and destructiveness through religious or eth ethical practices and rituals. But as I mentioned, Einstein, Einstein argued in favor of a militant pacifism, and perhaps now we can ourselves talk about an aggressive form of nonviolence. To do this within the time I have, I propose that we think first about an ethics of nonviolence that presupposes forms of dependency and interdependency that are unmanageable or become the source of conflict and aggression. Second, I propose that we consider how our understanding of equality relates to the ethics and politics of nonviolence. And for that connection to make sense, we have to admit into our idea of political equality the equal grievability of lives. Only a disorientation from a presumptive individualism will let us understand the possibility of an aggressive nonviolence, one that emerges in the midst of conflict, one that takes hold in the force field of violence itself. That means that equality is not only the equality of individuals with one another, but a concept that first becomes thinkable once we wage a critique of individualism itself. OK, let us then try a different story. It begins this way. Every individual emerges in the course of the process of individuation. No one is born an individual. If someone becomes an individual over time, he, she, they do not escape the fundamental conditions of dependency in the course of that process. That condition cannot be escaped in time. We are, all of us in this room, regardless of our political viewpoints in the present, born into a condition of radical dependency. As we reflect back on that condition as adults, we are perhaps slightly insulted or alarmed, or perhaps dismiss the thought, or even come to hate the person who reminds us about such topics. Perhaps someone with a strong sense of individual self-sufficiency will indeed be offended by the fact that there was a time when one could not feed oneself or could not stand on one's own. And many of us still need support to stand, indeed support to eat. But in fact, I want to suggest no one actually does stand on one's own. Um, strictly speaking, no one feeds oneself. Disability studies has shown us that in order to move along the street, there must be pavements that allow for movement, especially if one only moves with a chair or with an instrument for support. The pavement is also an instrument of support, as are the traffic lights and the curb stops when they exist. It's not only those of us who are disabled who require support in order to move, to be fed, or indeed to breathe. All of these basic human capacities are supported in one way or another. No one moves or breathes or finds food who is not supported by a world that provides an environment built for passage, that prepares and distributes food so that it makes its way to our mouths, a world that sustains the environment that makes possible the kind of air that we can breathe. Dependency can be defined partly as a dependency on social and material structures, but also on the environment, all of which make life possible. Regardless of our quarrels with psychoanalysis, and everyone has a quarrel, I presume, for that is what psychoanalysis is, a theory and practice with which people quarrel. Indeed, there is no psychoanalysis without a quarrel with psychoanalysis. Perhaps we can say that we do not overcome the dependency of infancy when we become adults. That does not mean that the adult is dependent in the exact same way the infant is. It only means that we are, we are creatures who constantly imagine a self-sufficiency only to find that image of ourselves undermined repeatedly in the course of life. This is, of course, a Lacanian position articulated most famously by the mirror stage, the jubilant boy who thinks he stands on his own as he looks in the mirror, and yet watching him, we know that the mother or some obscured object support, what is called a trotte bébé, holds him in front of the mirror as he rejoices in his radical self-sufficiency. 
Perhaps we can say that the founding conceits of liberal individualism are a kind of mirror stage, that they take place within an imaginary of this kind. What supports, what dependency has to be disavowed for the fantasy of self-sufficiency to take hold, for the story to start with a timeless adult masculinity? The implication of this scene, of course, is that it would seem that masculinity is identified with a phantasmatic self-sufficiency, and femininity is identified with the support provided for him, a support that is regularly disavowed or occluded. This picture and story lock us into an economy of gender relations that hardly serves us. Heterosexuality becomes the presumptive frame, and it is derived from the theory of mother and child, which is but one way of imagining the relations of support for the child. The gendered structure of the family is taken for granted, including, of course, the obscuring of the mother's labor of care and the full absence of the father. And if we accept all this as the symbolic structure of things rather than a specific imaginary, we accept the operation of a law that can only be changed incrementally um, and over a very long period of time. But the theory that describes this fantasy, this asymmetry, this scene, including the gender division of labor, can end up reproducing and validating its terms unless it shows us another way out, unless it asks about the scene prior to or outside this scene, the moment, as it were, before the beginning. So let us move, as it were, from dependency to interdependency and see how that alters our understanding of vulnerability, conflict, adulthood, sociality, violence, and politics. I ask this question because at both a political and economic level, the, fl the facts of global interdependency are sometimes systematically and sometimes periodically denied, or they are exploited. Of course, advertisements for corporations celebrate a globalized world, but that idea of corporate expansion captures only one sense of globalization, and that one is linked to increased, increasing conditions of precarity. National sovereignty may be waning, and yet new nationalisms insist upon that frame. So one reason it is so difficult to convince a government such as my own that global warming is a real threat to the future of the livable world is that their rights to expand production, profit, and markets to exploit nature remain centered on augmenting a national wealth and power. Perhaps they do not conceive of the possibility that what they do affects all regions of the world and that what happens in all regions of the world affects the very possibility of the continuation of a livable environment, one on which we all depend. Or perhaps they do see that and they know they are engaging in globally destructive activity. And that too seems like a right, a power, a prerogative that should be compromised by nothing and by no one. We'll have to think a little later about the right to destroy, how that gets invoked and why. The idea of global, global the, the idea of global obligations that serves all inhabitants of the world, human and animal, is about as far from the neoliberal consecration of individualism as it could be, and yet it is regularly dismissed as naive. So I am summoning my courage to expose my naivete, my fantasy, my counter-fantasy, if you will. Some people ask in more or less incredulous tones, how can you believe in global obligations? That is surely naive. But when I ask, do you want to live in a world where no one was arguing for global obligations? They usually say no. OK. I also uh, uh, believe that this emphasis on global obligations is in the spirit of the Gifford Lectures, by the way. So I want to argue that only by avowing this interdependency does it become possible to formulate global obligations, including, 
obligations toward the migrants, the Roma, those who live in precarious situations, or indeed those who are subject to occupation and war, those who are subject to institutional and systemic racism, women who are subject to domestic and public violence, harassment in the workplace, and gender nonconforming people who are exposed to bodily harm, including incarceration and death. I want to suggest as well that a new idea of equality can emerge only from a more fully imagined interdependency, an imagining that unfolds in practices and institutions, in new forms of civic and political life. Oddly enough, equality imagined in this way would not be, strictly speaking, an equality among individuals. Of course, it's good that one person is treated as equal to another. I'm all in favor of anti-discrimination law, don't get me wrong. But that formulation, as important as it is, does not tell us by virtue of what set of interrelationships social and political equality first becomes thinkable. When equality is understood as an individual right, I have a right to be treated equally or in the same way as someone else, on the assumption that someone else is being treated well, it is separated from the social obligations we bear toward one another. To formulate equality on the basis of the relations that define our enduring social existence, that define us as social living creatures, is to make a collective claim on society, if not a claim to the social as the framework within which our imaginings of equality, freedom, and nonviolence take form and make sense. Whatever claims of equality are then formulated emerge from relations between or among people in the name of those relations and those bonds, but not, strictly speaking, of an individual subject. Equality is thus a feature of social relations defined in part by an increasingly avowed interdependency. I have argued elsewhere that vulnerability should not be considered as a subjective state, but rather as a feature of our shared and interdependent lives. We are, neither, we are never simply vulnerable. Um, vulnerability is not a kind of steady state of, of a subject. It's rather um, that we are always vulnerable to a situation, a person, a social structure, some thing upon which we rely and in relation to which we are exposed. Perhaps we can say that we are vulnerable to those environmental and social structures that make our lives possible, and when they falter, so do we. To be dependent implies vulnerability. One is vulnerable to the social structure upon which one depends. If the structure fails, one is exposed to a precarious condition. But if that is so, we're not talking about my vulnerability or yours, but rather a feature of the relation that binds us to one another and to the larger structures and institutions upon which we de depend for the, continu con the continuation of life. Vulnerability is not exactly the same as dependency. I depend on someone, something, or some condition in order to live. But when that person disappears, or that object is withdrawn, or that social institution falls apart, I become vulnerable to dispossession, abandonment, or exposure in ways that may well prove not to be livable. The relational understanding of vulnerability shows that we are not altogether separable from the conditions that make our lives possible. In other words, we are never fully individuated. One implication of this view is that the obligations that bind us to one another follow from the condition of interdependency that makes our lives possible. The political organization of life itself requires interdependency and the equality it implies is acknowledged through policy institutions, civil society, and government. If we accept, and, de and indeed transnational structures, if we accept the proposal that there are or must be global obligations, obligations that are globally shared and ought to be considered binding, they cannot be reduced to obligations that nation states have toward one another. They would have to be post-national in character, traversing borders and navigating their terms. Since populations at the border or crossing the border, stateless people, refugees, are those included in the larger network of interrelationships implied 
by global obligations. So I've been arguing that the task, as I imagined it, is not to overcome dependency in order to achieve self-sufficiency, but rather to accept interdependency as a condition of equality. That formulation meets with an immediate and important challenge. After all, after all there are forms of colonial power <clears throat> that seek to establish the so-called dependency of the colonized. And these kinds of arguments seek to make dependency an essential and uh, pathological feature of populations who have been colonized. They are colonized because they are dependent. Their dependency is not a consequence of colonization. That deployment of dependency confirms both racism and colonialism. It identifies the cause of a group's subordination in, um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a psychosocial feature of the group itself. The colonizer, as Albert Memmi has argued, understands himself as the adult in the scene, the one who can bring a colonized population out of their childlike dependency and into an enlightened adulthood. We find this figure of the colonized as the child in Kant's famous essay, What is Enlightenment? But the truth is that the colonizer depends upon the colonized, for when the colonized refuse to remain subordinate, then the colonizer is threatened with the loss of colonial power. Of course, it looks good to overcome dependency if one has been made dependent on a colonial structure or made dependent on an unjust state or an exploitative marriage or labor contract. Breaking with those forms of dependency can be part of the process of emancipation, of claiming both equality and freedom. But which version of equality do we then accept and which version of freedom? If we break the ties of dependency in an effort to overcome exploitation, does that mean that we now value independence? Well, yes, it does. But if that independence becomes a mode of breaking ties with those forms of interdependency that we value and that we require, what then follows? If independence returns us to the sovereignty of the individual or the nation state in such a way that post-sovereign understandings of cohabitation and interrelationality become unthinkable, then we've returned to a version of self-sufficiency that implies endless conflict. After all, it is only from a renewed and revalued notion of interdependency among regions and hemispheres that we can begin to think about the threat to the environment, the problem of the global slum, systemic racism, the condition of stateless people whose migration is a common global responsibility, um, even the more thorough overcoming of colonial modes of power depends such a, on such an imagining. So far, I've been moving between a psychoanalytic and social understanding of interdependency, laying the groundwork for a practice of nonviolence within a new egalitarian imaginary. These levels of analysis have to be brought together without using the psychoanalytic framework as a model for all social relations. The critique of ego psychology does give a social meaning to psychoanalysis that links it with a broader consideration of the conditions of sustenance and persistence, question central to any conception of the biopolitical. My counterthesis to the state of nature hypothesis is that nobody can sustain um, oneself on one's own. The body is not and never was a self-subsisting kind of being, which is but one reason why the metaphysics of substance was never a particularly good frame for understanding what a body is. The body is given over to others in order to persist. Does metaphysics have a way to conceptualize this vital paradox? As interpersonal as this relation may sound, it is also socially organized in a broader sense, pointing as it does to the social organization of life. We all start with having been given over. That's what happens when a child is born. Someone gives the child over to someone else if that child is not radically abandoned. We are, from the start, handled against our will. Even poor Oedipus, although that was a nearly fatal act, since his mother handed him over to someone who was supposed to kill him, 
being handed over is not always a beautiful scene. Okay. The infant is given over by someone to some, someone else, and the caregiver is in some ways given over to the task of care, and sometimes quite emphatically prior to any act of will. Care is not always consensual. We know it's not always paid for. It can be a way of getting wrecked time and again by the demands of a wailing and hungry creature. But there is here a larger claim that does not rely on any particular account of the social organization of motherhood or caregiving. Our enduring dependency on social and economic forms of life is not something we ever grow out of. It's not a dependency that converts to independence in time. When there is nothing to depend upon, when social structures fail or are withdrawn, then life itself fails. Life becomes precarious. That enduring condition may become more poignant in child care and care for the elder, elderly or for those who are physically challenged, but there are no exceptions to this general formulation. Well, what does it mean to be given over? Does it imply that we are also those to whom someone or, or, or some number of people are also given over? Are we at once given over and those to whom others are given over, a kind of asymmetry for each that is nevertheless a reciprocity when regarded as a social relation. When the world fails us, when we ourselves become world, worldless in the social sense, then the body suffers and shows its precarity. And that mode of demonstrating precarity is itself or carries with it a political demand and even an expression of outrage. To be a body differentially exposed to harm or to death is precisely to exhibit a form of precarity, but also to suffer a form of inequality that is manifestly unjust. So the situation of so many populations increasingly subject to unlivable precarity raises for us the question of global obligations. If we ask why should any of us care about those who suffer at a distance from us, the answer is not to be found in paternalistic justifications, but in the fact that we inhabit the world together in relations of interdependency. Our fates are, as it were, given over to one another. So we have moved from the Robinson Crusoe figure with which we began. Um, the embodied subject is, um, as I'm hoping to define it, um, uh, uh, is marked by its lack of self-sufficiency from the start. And this also gives us some indication of how longing, desire, rage, and anxiety all figure in this scene, especially under conditions when exposure becomes unbearable or dependency becomes unmanageable. Suffering those conditions can lead to understandable rage, to anger, even to violence. Under what conditions does interdependency become a scene of aggression, conflict, and violence? How do we understand the destructive potential of this social bond? Interdependency raises that question of the destructiveness that is a potential part of any living relation, one that can rupture relationality intermittently or permanently, one that is the rupture potentially at work in all social relations. If our ethical and political practices remain restricted to an individual mode of life or decision making, or indeed to a virtue ethics that reflects on who we are as individuals, we risk losing sight of that interdependency that establishes an embodied social and relational version of equality, as well as the possibility of destructiveness and the ethical obligations by which it is restrained or rerouted. What difference to our thinking would such a framework imply? Well, most forms of violence are committed to inequality, whether or not that commitment is explicitly thematized. And the way the decision is framed, whether or not to use violence on any given occasion, makes a number of assumptions about those with regard to whom violence is to be waged or not. For instance, it's not possible to comply with an interdiction against violence if the living creature that is not to be killed cannot be named or known. If the person, the group, the population is not considered already living and alive, how is the command not to kill them to be understood? That command makes sense um, uh, only if we assume that those 
who we are considering are living and that they can be named as such and safeguarded by an interdiction against violence. If the interdiction against killing rests on the presumption that all lives are valuable, that they bear value as lives and their status as living beings, then the universality of the claim is good only on the condition that value extends equally to all living beings. This means that we have to think not only about persons, but animals, and not only about living creatures, but living processes, the systems and form of life. There is a, fur a further point. A life has to be grievable. That is, its loss has to be conceptualizable as a loss. For an interdiction against violence and destruction to include that life among those living beings to be safeguarded from violence. The condition under which some lives are more grievable than others means that this condition of equality has not been met. The consequence is that a prohibition against killing applies only to those lives that are grievable, but not to those who are considered ungrievable, since those are the ones who are already lost or were never fully alive or don't really count as subjects within this ethical calculus. The differential distribution of grievable lives has to be addressed if an ethics of nonviolence is to work on the assumption of the equal value of lives. The unequal distribution of grievability might be one framework for understanding the differential production of humans and other creatures within a structure of inequality or indeed within a structure of violent disavowal. Moral philosophers and theologians have asked uh, what grounds the claim that interdiction against killing is wrong. Well, the usual ways of handling this question, um, or the usual ways to ask whether that interdiction commandment or prohibition is absolute, um, whether it has a theological or a conventional status, whether it is a matter of law or morality. It is also invariably accompanied by a further question, namely, whether there are bona fide exceptions to such an interdiction when injuring or even killing is justified. And then debates tend to unfold about what, if any, exceptions exist and what they indicate about the less than absolute character of that interdiction. It's at this juncture that self-defense usually enters the picture. The exception to the rule is important, perhaps more important than the rule itself. For instance, if there are exceptions to the prohibition on killing, and if there are always such exceptions, that suggests that the prohibition against killing is less than absolute. It's a prohibition that on occasion fails to assert itself, or holds itself back, or suspends its own powers of restraint. Self-defense is a highly ambiguous term, as we can see in militaristic modes of foreign policy that justify every attack as self-defense. And in the contemporary US, um, uh, we now have laws that make provisions for what is called preemptive killing. If you imagine someone is coming at you, you may kill first. At least police are given that right. In, in practice, this extends to the defense of loved ones, right, my self-defense, children or animals or others who are considered close to you, relations that are part of one's broader sense of self. It therefore makes sense to ask what defines and limits those relations, what elaborates the conception of self to include groups of others in this way, and why they are usually understood as biological relatives or those related through conjugal ties, right? So someone uh, says to me, um, um, I uh, am a pacifist, but um, I will commit violence in the name of self-defense. And I ask, this is true, by the way, um, uh, well, would you defend your daughter? Well, yeah, of course I would defend my daughter. OK, so it's you and your daughter. Would you defend um, your brother? Yes, of course I would defend my brother. OK. Um, and what about your Uncle Tony? Well, Uncle Tony hasn't always been good to me. <laughs> but, so there's a line, right? But what makes the line, right? It's like those who are, these people are part of me. I defend, I defend them as I would defend myself. But then others, well, I don't know. 
But what about that other group of people? I don't speak their language, right? I've never met them. Okay. Um, so one question is what or who is part of the self that you are and what relations are included under the rubric of the self which is justified in defending itself? Are we perhaps more ethically obligated to preserve the lives of those who are close to us or like us than those who are far away or appear to be dissimilar? If I defend myself and those who are considered part of myself are proximate enough so that I know and love them, then this self that I am is, yes, relational, but the relations are delimited uh, by belonging to my proximate sphere. So one's justified in using violence to defend those who belong to this broader region of myself, but maybe not the others. Some group is covered by my expanded claims of self-defense. They're understood to be worthy of a violent protection against violence, a violence done to others so that it's not done to one's own. The interdiction against violence reemerges within the exception. Now it is that group composed of those who are not part of my region of the self who threaten my group with violence or against those I'm apparently justified in waging violence. Or there is some group I don't understand and I can't possibly be asked to intervene on their behalf. The interdiction now is imposed on the other group, the one that is not my own, not to engage in violent acts. Absent that operative interdiction, I or we are justified in killing. Further, when we get to that point in which one, oneself or one's group violently defends what it takes to be itself against violence, not only is there a rather large and consequential exception made to the interdiction against violence, but the distinction between the force of the interdiction and the violence interdicted starts to collapse. The exception to the interdiction opens up onto a situation of war in which it's right to defend oneself or one's own violently and in the name of self-defense, but certainly not a whole host of others who don't belong to oneself. That means there are always those whose lives I do not defend and I do not value, and there will always be those who seek to do violence to those whose lives are intricately bound up with my own, part of my extended region of the self, which, include, which would include those others I recognize as having a binding ethical claim upon me. At such moments, the interdiction against violence, again, proves itself to be less than absolute, and the exception to the interdiction becomes a potential state of war, or at least coextensive with its logic. Since if one will kill for this or that person who is proximate and affiliated, what finally distinguishes the proximate from those who live at a distance? And under what conditions could that distinction be regarded as ethically justifiable in distinguishing between the value of lives? Now, of course, and I'm moving towards the end of my remarks here, international human rights interventionists and what we call hawks in the United States would argue that what follows is we, especially in the first world, should paternalistically always be prepared to go to war for everyone. That's not exactly what my government is doing now, but we did do that in the past. Uh, but my point is decidedly different. The exceptions to the norm of nonviolence actually begin to elaborate forms of group identification, even nationalism, that result in a certain war logic. It goes like this. I defend those who are like me or who might be understood as part of my region of the self, but not those who are unlike me. And that converts rather easily into the claim I will defend only those who are like me or recognizable to me, but will defend against those who are not recognizable to me and with whom no ties of belonging seem to exist. Now, with those examples, Mm -hmm. I wish to pose the question of whether there's a norm that is invoked to distinguish those who belong to the group whose lives are worth living and those who do not belong to that group and whose lives are not worth living or indeed defending. For implicit in the way the exception to the interdiction against violence works is that there are those who are understood to belong and to deserve protection against violence whereas there are those who do not belong, well, in relation to them, I invoke my principle of nonviolence and I do not intervene on their behalf. Although that may sound cynical, the point is meant only to foreground the fact that some of our moral principles may well be already in the sway of other political interests and frameworks. 
the distinction between populations that are worth violently defending and those who are not implies that some lives are simply considered more valuable than others. So my suggestion was to consider that the principle by which conditions under which the exception to nonviolence are identified is at once a measure for distinguishing among populations those one is ready to grieve or, or do not qualify as grievable and those one is prepared to, grie to grieve and whose death ought in all instances to be forestalled. So if we make exceptions to the principle of nonviolence, it shows that we're ready to fight harm, maybe even murder, and that we're prepared to give moral reasons for doing so. And according to this logic, one does this either in self-defense or in defense of those who belong to one's broader sense of self with whom identification possible. And if that last proposition is true, then there is a moral justification for violence that emerges precisely on a demographic basis, that is, on the, on the grounds of distinguishing among the value of different populations. So I'm suggesting that what started in my final section here as a moral framework for understanding the interdiction against violence, its presuppositions, and its exceptions, has turned into a different kind of problem, a political problem. In the first instance, the norm we invoke to distinguish those lives we're willing to defend and those that are considered dispensable is part of a larger operation of biopower that unjustifiably distinguishes between grievable and ungrievable lives. But if we accept the notion that all lives are equally grievable and that the political world ought rightly to be organized in such a way that this principle is affirmed and reflected in the organization of economic and institutional life, then we arrive at a different conclusion and perhaps even another way to approach the problem of nonviolence. After all, if a life from the start is regarded as grievable, then every effort will be taken to safeguard that life or to support that life, minimizing the pro probability of harm and destruction. What we might call the radical equality of the grievable is what um, has to be the demographic precondition for an ethics of nonviolence that does not make the exception. This leads me to my final point. Oh, 807, okay. Um, this brings me to my final point. The ethical stand of nonviolence has to be linked to a commitment to radical equality. And more specifically, the practice of nonviolence requires an opposition to biopolitical forms of racism and war logics that regularly distinguish between lives worth safeguarding and those that are not. For instance, collateral damage or populations conceived as obstructions to policy and military aims and therefore dispensable. Further, we have to consider how a tacit war logic enters into the biopolitical management of populations. If migrants come, they will destroy us, or they will destroy culture, or they will destroy Europe or the UK. This conviction then licenses violent destruction or the slower death in life of detention camps. And it's, it's uh, directed against a population that is phantasmatically construed as the locus of destruction. According to that war logic, it is a matter of the lives of refugees or, or of the lives of those who claim to have the right to be defended against the refugees. Um, racist and paranoid versions of self-defense authorize the destruction of another population. The ethical and political practice of nonviolence can rely neither exclusively on the dyadic encounter uh, nor on the bolstering of a prohibition. It requires rather a political opposition to biopolitical forms of racism and war logics that rely on phantasmagoric inversions that occlude the binding and inter interdependent character of our social relations. It requires as well an account of why and under what conditions the frameworks for understanding violence and nonviolence or violence and self-defense seem to invert into one another, causing confusion about how best to pin down those terms. Why, for instance, is a petition for peace in Turkey called a violent act? Why is a human barricade thwarting the police sometimes called an act of violent aggression? Under what conditions and within which frameworks does the inversion of violence and nonviolence occur?
There is no way to practice nonviolence without first interpreting violence and nonviolence, especially in a world in which violence is increasingly justified in the name of security, nationalism, and neo-fascism. The state monopolizes its violence by calling its critics violent. We know this from Gramsci and from Benjamin. Hence, we should be wary about those who claim that violence is necessary to curb or check violence, those who praise the force of law, including the police and the prisons, as final arbiters. To oppose violence is to understand that violence does not always take the form of the blow. The institutional forms through which it operates compel us to ask whose life appears as a life, whose loss would register as a loss. How does the demographic imaginary function in ethics, policy, and politics. If we operate within the horizon in which violence cannot be identified, where lives vanish from the realm of the living before they are killed, we will not be able to think, to know, and to act in ways that embed the political and the ethical, that understand the claim of relational obligations within the global sphere. We have to break open the horizon of this every day in which so many inequalities and effacements inform our policies. I doubt that we need a state of nature, but we do need an altered state of perception, a disorientation without which we will not find our way toward an ethical and political life in which aggression and sorrow do not immediately convert into violence, in which we might be able to endure the difficulty of social bonds we never chose and the importance of a persistence that is relational, fragile, sometimes unbearable, always necessary. Many people say arguing for nonviolence is unrealistic, but perhaps they are too enamored with reality. When I ask, do you want to live in a world in which no one was arguing for nonviolence, where no one held out for that impossibility, people generally say no. Thank you. <laughs>